Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Let's get started with a new chapter about transformer and large language model. So this is the most exciting chapter of this course, a lot of modern stuff. So large language model, uh, ChatGPT came 20, later of 2022, uh, 2022, which bring a lot of excitement to the community. So here we prompted uh, ChatGPT to uh, make a syllabus for our course, Tiny ML and Efficient Deep Learning Computing. And this is the syllabus that comes out uh, with a course overview, with the uh, uh, course objectives, prerequisites, and even come up with a pretty good syllabus, introduction to tiny ML, edge computing, efficient neural architectures, model compression techniques, quantizations, prunings, and edge AI hardware makes a lot of sense. But serving and training such large language model is pretty expensive, taking a lot of GPU hours, uh, the train and run inference to scale them up on both training and inference, very costly. So today we are going to first introduce the techniques behind the large language model. What is their uh, workload? What does the workload look like? It's actually much more complicated than just matrix multiplication, lots of details. We want to understand deeply about those algorithms before we can accelerate them in the next lecture. So here are some other, other examples. Like Google Translate can easily translate between uh, different languages. And also here it shows the GitHub Copilot uh, to write a piece of code uh, to here to parse a list of expenses. And then it's going to automatically come, come up with uh, the code generated by GitHub Copilot. And even multi-model large language model building personal assistance, reading your screen, reading your pictures, understanding videos, like in this example, answer the question uh, in the following figure, provide intermediate steps, like how long is this edge given here, here, and then uh, GPT-4V can calculate uh, four square plus eight square equals C square, and then can solve uh, for the C. And here, even there is a demo of using ChatGPT for practical uh, use cases trying to fix, um, trying to lower the seat. And it's asking how to lower uh, my bike seat. Input it, uh, take a photo and input it. To lower your bike seat, uh, locate the quick release lever. If it is a quick re release lever, if not, you need to add a wrench. And then I'm going to take a deeper, deeper, closer look, take another photo um, and ask. Uh, the GPT-4B, is this the lever? Just to confirm some of the details. And it's going to um, it's going to say it's not a lever, it's a boat. You need an island driver. And I'm going to input the menu and also a toolbox for this kind of inter interactive chat. And we are going to see those challenges dealing with those long contacts for such interactive uh, conversation. Here is my menu and toolbox. Do I have the right tool? Yes, you have the right tool. Okay, in the left section of the toolbox, you have to do this, use do this to loosen that, that. It can actually refer uh, uh, to reason across these two images. One is the menu, the other is a toolbox. It can tell you according to the menu, you should use this tool. Okay, pretty exciting. So we are going to witness some of the cha technical challenges, computing efficiency challenges for such interactive conversation especially a long conversation. Uh, we're going to, we are going to learn about KD cache, where as the um, conversation gets long, the KD cache will grow linearly, but how large that will grow and how prohibitive it's going to be, especially when we are trying to process videos, which contain many frames of images. And each, each image might be worth like hundreds of tokens. And your KD cache will soon grow pretty large. We require lots of memory, become super expensive. And we are going to discuss techniques to make them more efficient. Okay, so uh, this is the lecture plan for today. We'll first introduce the transformer basics. You may have heard the paper transformer is all you need. Um, even the Nobel Prize is closely related to that. So we're going to learn uh, what are the components of the transformers. And also we are going to talk about transformer variants, different changes, optimizations, and also introduce the large language models like Lama 2, Lama 3, uh, et cetera. And also advanced topics, including uh, briefly talk about multi-model language model. 
Okay, first chapter, transformer basics. So let's first revisit very quickly the NLP tasks. What are the categories of NLP tasks? What is the history? How people used to deal with it before the transformer era? Okay. Roughly two categories of tasks. One is discriminative task. The other is generative task. So discriminative task, uh, given a sentence, we want to find um, some classification result, uh, some su such as sentiment analysis, text classification, uh, textual entitlement, those kind of uh, summary tasks given a fixed sentence that is a discriminative task. The generative task, um, given the sentence, we want to generate the next token. So that's the language modeling. Similarly, machine translation, given input language, uh, translate to another language, and also summarization. So you need to generate new tokens, okay? new sentences. So those are generative tasks. And pre-transformer era, people have been using uh, recurrent neural nets very widely uh, for these tasks. Okay? So uh, you have a fixed uh, working memory, fixed working memory, um, but it struggles to maintain those uh, long uh, long-term dependencies, okay? So if you have a pretty long sentence, you probably wanna uh, save a lot of information rather than um, compressing all the information within a uh, very small, very limited amount of a hidden layer uh, as we did in uh, recurrent neural nets. But it's pretty memory efficient. Right? Uh, you have a fixed amount of, uh, um, you have a fixed hidden layer Okay, so uh, I like large language model where the KV cache will grow linearly. This has fixed constant um, memory. And you can also enroll it okay, to different time steps um, uh, during the training time. You do uh, back propagation through time uh, to calculate the gradient. So there's actual dependency across different tokens. Uh, for example, uh, the third token depends on the second and the first token, and that limits the training efficiency, limits the, since it has limited parallelism. You cannot compute uh, this node and uh, before uh, the node before it. Okay, there's the, the dependency hurts the parallelism. People have also been using convolution neural nets to deal with language tasks. Okay, so we can do 1D convolution, one dimension convolution, and okay? so these three tokens. Um, Three dimensions will uh, impact uh, x1 slash, x2 slash will depend on zero, x1, x2, etc. with a receptive field of three. So we can have a sliding window. Uh, we have a sentence, this movie has amazing uh, diverse uh, characters and we use a sliding window of three. Um, so each word that has um, uh, the embedding is uh, hidden dimension is three. We have a windows, window loss of three so that we can evolve with a 1D convolution and produce the result for the next layer, get a feature vector. So what is the limitation here for convolution? Very limited context information, right? You can only see adjacent three tokens. Unlike transformer, you want to see the entire sentence, okay, everything before it versus only adjacent three tokens. So naturally, we can deal with that by, by what? By stacking multiple layers. You can have one layer receptive field of three, two layers receptive field of five, and then on and so on. You can have a larger receptive field by stacking multiple layers. But within a single layer, um, the receptive field is very limited. So there are, uh, for RN and LSTMs, there are also uh, two categories. One is bidirectional, one is unidirectional. So for the bidirectional LSTM, each um, token here can see both uh, the previous state and also the future state. That's how we call it bidirectional. Versus single directional, each time step, we can only see the previous, uh, previous time step, okay? So bidirectional RNs, uh, are used for distributive tasks for encoding versus the unidirectional RNs are used for generative tasks uh, like decoding. Because when you are generating a token, 
uh, generating a new word, um, it, it is only dependent on the previous, previous tokens. Therefore, uh, unidirectional RNs are used for generative tasks. So what are the problems with RNs and RNCMs? So first of all, it's hard to model those long-term relationships. Okay? So it takes a pretty long time for the information to propagate. It's actually all sequence long steps to model the interaction between two tokens. For example, um, we, we want to um, model words versus shaft. Okay? You have to go through any steps, all sequence long steps, to model the, uh, the interaction between two tokens. The images is fine. Images has locality. The two pixels very far away from each other may not interact, but languages doesn't have the locality. It's highly possible something you said much earlier is very uh, highly correlated with some, some words, some tokens you just said a moment ago. Okay? So you don't want to go through uh, all sequence enough number of layers to uh, model the interaction between two tokens. And also the, um, it has limited training parallelism because of the dependency. Okay, so this is computation graph for RNs. Uh, this is step zero. You may have learned those in the prerequisite 6026. Uh, step time one, time two, time three. And this is the wavefront. You have to propagate the information. It has a dependency. You can now calculate uh, all the embeddings in parallel. So that results in very limited training parallelism since the states have a very strong dependency to the earlier states. Right? And it takes n steps to get to step n, okay, from step one to step ten, it takes n steps. You cannot parallelize them, making the uh, GPU training uh, more difficult. So given those uh, constraints, uh, Transformer solved a lot of those problems. Okay? So this is the architecture of a uh, Transformer block. We'll go through uh, each component step by step, starting with the uh, tokenizer, okay, the tokenizer, and then how to uh, embed the tokens, basically the embedding. And then we will talk about the attention mechanism, including um, the MHA, multi head attention, to model the uh, information between different tokens, and also the FFN layer to uh, model the information independently for each dimension, the layer norm, uh, the residual connection, the positional uh, encoding, and finally, the, uh, the final, making the final prediction with a linear hat. So let's start with uh, the tokenizer, how to tokenize the words. So what is the, what is the token? Uh, intuitively, a token is very similar to a word, but um, it's it's a it's a basic component of a word. For example, uh, large generative models. Large itself is a word. It's also a token. And generative that's a single word, but it's two. It has two tokens. One is generative. The other is relative. Okay, generative. So that's two tokens. And models. For example, uh, actually they are divided into uh, four tokens. E, uh, dot G dot. Uh, for example. In this whole um, uh, this whole paragraph, there are 110 words, and that translates to 162 tokens, which is slightly more than the number of words, because some of the words uh, actually contain two tokens, like this one, parallelism. So parallel is one token, ism is one token. Okay? And this hands-on experience, actually, hands-on is three tokens. Times dash on. Okay, so that's the uh, slight difference between the number of words and number of tokens. Intuitively, you can just think about a token as a word. So we want to digitalize everything, right? So that we can process them by, by computers. How do we digitalize um, the, the words, the tokens? Okay, so that is the embedding. Okay, so we want to have a number to represent each token. Uh, one method is to do the one hot encoding. So uh, we have uh, what, uh, 100K columns. Say we have 100K words in the vocabulary. 
and we have only one one in each vector. Okay, so boom, we have the first entry to be one. All the remaining entries are zero. Two, maybe the third one, just an example. Third one is one, the others are all zero. Movie, uh, this one is one. So it's one hot, only one of entry is one. And we need a lot of uh, columns. Uh, since we may need to have a pretty large vocabulary. Each uh, column in the vector represents one possible word in the vocabulary. Is this representation efficient? Actually, it's not, because the vector can get very long for a large vocabulary. And lots of them are zero. Actually, all of them are zero except for only one value. Okay, it's a super sparse representation. You ended up storing a lot of zeros. A more efficient way uh, is to represent each word using the word embedding and using a vector, a unique vector to, to represent each word. For example, here we have, we are using three, uh, three dimensional, uh, hidden dimension to represent each word. The is represented by this vector 0 0.2, 0 0.4, minus 0 0.1. Good is represented by this three dimensional vector 0 0.7 minus 0 0.5, 0 0.3. Okay, so um, such word embedding can be trained end to end uh, for a particular task, for a downstream task. Some of the early pioneers in, uh, in this area include the word to back, the glove, word embedding. Okay, nowadays we can train them end to end given the downstream task. So in summary, each word is re represented by a vector, okay, and that's called the word embedding, so that we can feed feed uh, the sentences, digitalize the sentences, so that we can feed feed it into matrix modifications. Okay, so after getting the embedding, we'll process uh, each words, each tokens, and try to find the relationship uh, between each words, each tokens. Remember during the uh, convolution and also during the RNNs, the limitation is the limited receptive field and the limited parallelism. So let's see how does multi-head attention solve those problems. So here we wanna model the relationship between different tokens, okay? Convolution only model the relationship between the token and its adjacent neighbors, like three adjacent neighbors, very limited receptive field. But now we want to attend to all the tokens, okay, all the tokens, so that they can interact with each other. So what do we do here? We have n, n tokens. We want to have n square matrix to model the, uh, the, the interaction between each of them. So let's see how do we do that. Uh, on the right-hand side is the computation flow. Uh, we first have a, a input vector, n tokens, each token, the hidden dimension has the hidden dimension. And we uh, divide it into three parts by passing through three, uh, three matrices, uh, query, key, and value. And then we um, uh, query times the key transpose. Um, we get the attention, which is n by n matrix. Uh, the n, n by n matrix indicates the relationship between each token. Since we have n tokens and n tokens, we get a square matrix. Uh, optionally, we apply the mask, maybe the causal mask, uh, soft max, make sure it's sum up to one, and then we might multiply uh, this weighted uh, attention map with the V, the value, to get the output. In that way, we mingle the information between all the tokens. What is the uh, intuition behind that? It is the query key value design is very analogous to a retrieval system. Uh, just take a YouTube search as an example. So the query is basically like the uh, text prompt in the search bar, which are trying to search. The key is basically the title and uh, the descriptions of any content, say video in this case. And the value is the corresponding video. And you first find the relationship between uh, the query and the key. And that becomes the um, awaited map, awaited attention map, and use that uh, to to a weighted sum of the values. If some of them is very related, 
and you have a larger weight. If it is not, if it's less, you have a smaller weight. Okay. So you, you have the information uh, to model the entire sequence, not just adjacent three by three, five by five, ad adjacent tokens, but actually all the tokens. So we do the attention map by multiplying uh, the QK transpose to get the inner product. We need to normalize by the hidden dimension since different model may have different hidden dimension. Like Lama 2 has 4K hidden dimension uh, for 7 billion parameter model. A 70 billion parameter model may have a larger dimension. So we want to normalize that. And then we fo follow followed by the softmax to uh, make sure uh, each row sum up to one. But what is expensive here? So the attention computation has all n square complexity, since you want to attend each token with each other. Okay, have all n square complexity, which is the bad part. And finally, we multiply the attention weights uh, to do the weighted sum for the value, weighted sum for the value to get the final output. And let's see what does the attention map look like. Uh, so this is the attention map. An example of an attention matrix for matrix uh, for machine translation. Uh, this is English here. This is the French right here. Most of the words are attending to exactly the same words. And some of them, they are having the reverse order, reverse order. Uh, these words actually correspond to uh, the later word in English or it actually correspond to a later word in French. That's why we see this reverse diagonal. And the remaining words are in the diagonal direction meaning that each token in, in one language corresponds to the exact location in another language. So the attention mechanism basically finds the correspondence between the words, and they are, uh, they are found by, by tweening, not by any rules. So that is just one head uh, modeling one possible relationship. What if you want to model our uh, diverse relationships, okay? many relationships. So we want to add more heads to introduce this multi-head attention. So each head capture different semantics. So here we have uh, multiple heads, first one, second one, third one, three heads in this case. They each have the, uh, has their own uh, transformation matrix for the QKV. Um, the final output is contaminated we just contaminate the result from different heads, it goes to a linear projection layer, linear projection layer uh, to merge all those features. And why we need multiple heads? Um, this is a visualization of different heads. Actually, we can see that uh, each head capture uh, very different uh, semantics. Some of them is just diagonal, diagonal. Some of them has some vertical information captured, vertical information captured. So different heads are capturing the subtle, uh, different subtle relationship between uh, different tokens, adding the capacity, adding the capacity to the model. And next, attention mask. Okay, so there are two kinds of uh, masks. One is um, causal, the other is global. Okay, so this is the global attention map, meaning that every token can see every token. Even um, the we can see the future token. Okay? So this is a global n by n, uh, everything is one, that's the mask versus causal. Okay? Each token can only see everything before it, but it can see nothing after that. Okay? We call it causal. So the um, attention mask basically is a triangle, is a down triangle, since you cannot see the future tokens. I only each token I only see the past tokens. Uh, so the um, the mass can be represented on the right hand side. Uh, this is a global self attention. This is causal self attention. In global self attention, um, each output can see all the all the inputs, no matter if uh, it's before that or it's after that. But in the causal self attention layer, each token can only see itself and everything before that. For example, token six can only see uh, token six and everything before uh, token six from zero to zero to five. Okay, so that's the difference between 
uh, the global and the causal self attention. Okay, so the next part is the FFN layer. Since multi high attention focuses on uh, modeling the relationship between uh, the tokens, but there is no element wise nonlinear area. So we all we not only want to uh, model the relationship between tokens, we also want to uh, give some capacity um, to model the, uh, the, the each token independently. So we added a, a feed forward network, just a, a, a fully connected layer to help with such local feature modeling. The vanilla implementation consists of two matrix modifications. Um, one is projecting from C to 4D passes through a ReLU or a GLU, um, and then um, convert it down to, from 4D uh, to B. Okay, so it can rep be represented by two matrix modifications um, with uh, ReLU in the middle. Okay, so that's the simplest uh, implementation. And let's see, for a 7 billion plant model, the hidden dimension is roughly 4K. Uh, for 175 billion plant model, it's roughly 12K. And why do we have such inverted bottleneck? We want to add more information and provide more capacity uh, to the FFN layer. And later, we are going to visit some of the uh, design variants paired with uh, such simple FFN layer. The normalization uh, D square. Yes, that D is basically this D. For example, 4K, uh, this is the 4K. And where is that 4K coming from? It's actually uh, exactly from here. In a dimension. Yeah. You can maybe just remember some simple case like four, uh, the seven B, the hidden dimension is four. And the number of has is 32. Okay. The number of has is 32 in the seven B model. So seven B model is the one we are going to use in the homework. Uh, and I actually it's quite, by, quite widely used, uh, easy to deploy. So. All right, and then we have the we want to introduce a layer norm, layer norm function. Previously, we have introduced the batch norm, batch norm. So across the batch dimension, and also the uh, this is the sequence length dimension, uh, token one, token two, token three, token four. So this is sequence length dimension, and this is the feature dimension, like four K, um, uh, hidden dimension B right here. So different from a batch dimension, we want to normalize across the feature dimension and okay, normalize across the feature dimension. Since different models may have different uh, dimensions, we want to normalize them. Some of them may have a pretty small hidden dimension, like 700, some of them may be pretty big, 4K, 12K, etc. So we want to uh, normalize across this feature dimension by subtracting the mean and also divided by the variance. Okay, and uh, we have two scaling, uh, scale, uh, a scaling factor and a bias. Okay, this is a learnable I, I find transformation, the gamma and the beta. The gamma and beta actually turn out to be super useful. Um, we are going to talk about that during the quantization part, uh, like the smooth quant or using rotation. Uh, we can fold lots of the uh, transformations into this gamma and beta. So when you're doing research, Pay attention to this gamma and beta. It is, but it contains very few parameters, but they are super powerful. It acts as not only a function to uh, stabilize and normalization, but also uh, can fold a lot of computing, a lot of the uh, uh, smoothing, uh, for example, quantization, lots of uh, uh, smoothing uh, capabilities into these two factors. And they are roughly. Uh, in historically, two ways to add the normalization. One is pre-norm, the other is post-norm. Uh, post-norm basically says you want to first do the multi high attention, then normalization. And the FFN, the normalization. 
pre normal is basically saying you want to first do the normalization and then body had the tension from layer norm and then SSM. And having um, this bypass layer um, to before the layer norm and after the MHA. Actually, the pre norm is getting uh, pretty popular these days due to not only better training stability, uh, but also it's very easy to uh, fold into the epi uh, the, uh, fold into the pre log of the matrix multiplication and turn them into a single kernel. And also, we can apply lots of the pre processing. So, if you multiply the tension, it's very difficult to quantize due to lots of outliers. Uh, you can fold it by uh, smooth it by folding the um, the factor, the multiplier into the linear norm. We are going to see more detail about that in the next lecture. Okay, so that's the uh, layer norm and also the residual connection. So different from convolution, where uh, position doesn't matter since for region tasks, it's uh, space invariant, but in language, the position matters. The position of each token matters. So we want to encode the position into uh, the model. Let's see how do we do the uh, positional encoding. Since attention and FFN, they do not differentiate the order of the input tokens. Uh, so let's see how do we do that. So positional uh, encoding basically provides the positional information. The same token appears in place one versus place 10, they are different. So we want to add a unique encoding to each word's position in the sentence. Okay, um, It's a function of the location, the position. Um, we call it absolute position encoding. So we have a raw uh, word embedding previously, and we want to add to the raw embedding um, to add the positional information to the raw word embedding. So here we have an example, 2D matrix. One is the feature dimension, like 4K. The other is the token dimension. Say we have a, a here it has 50 words, 50 tokens. And here the hidden dimension is 128. In this case, this is the tension map. Um, so what we add is that it's a function of the position. Okay, it's a function of the um, omega, omega times t, okay? And t here is the feature dimension, t is the token dimension, this is the token dimension, and i is the feature dimension. Um, and if you see the, um, the, the, the bars here versus here, they're actually quite different. That is due to the uh, frequency is very different. Okay, as k, uh, gets larger, um, the omega gets pretty smaller. The frequency uh, the frequency gets pretty small. So uh, actually no change across different key dimensions versus here, the frequency is pretty high. Uh, going from zero to 50, the change is pretty significant due to you have a pretty uh, high frequency versus here we have a very low frequency, okay? So this frequency is modulated, uh, W is modulated by K. And K is related to I. I is basically the uh, basically the feature dimension. So here, every um, for every uh, every I and every T, every token position, every hidden dimension position, you have a very unique combination of the uh, position encoding. Okay, so here we can finally uh, put it all together to have uh, the entire big picture of the uh, uh, transform transformer architecture, including the tokenizer, convert word into tokens, and then convert tokens into embeddings. And we can feed it with uh, the model head attention for modeling the information across tokens, and then add a layer to continue model the information within tokens, and then uh, layer norm, uh, residual connection, finally with the positional uh, encoding with the uh, linear head in the on the top, we can make final predictions. And accuracy wise, uh, transformer surpass this previously published models for a fraction of the training cost. So here is accuracy measured by the blue score, 
okay, which measures the similarity of the machine translation task to the uh, to a set of reference the translation strong truth translations. Transformer has higher blue score. This is the training cost. Two or three orders of magnitude uh, smaller training cost, since the architecture the design is quite efficient. <coughs> Okay, now let's take a break before we jump into the design variants. All right, welcome back. So let's continue to discuss about transformer design variants. So um, most of the initial design have been very widely used in the community, but uh, people designed several uh, several variants alternatives. For example, uh, the encoder decoder model, encoder only model versus the uh, most popular decoder only model. Um, and also, people designed from this absolute positional encoding and improve it to uh, relative positional encoding, only depend on relative position. Also, several KV cache optimizations. For example, not only the multi head attention but a smaller version, which is the multi-query attention uh, and also group query attention, which is very similar to uh, the normal convolution versus the depth-wise convolution versus group uh, group call. A trade-off between the capacity versus computational complexity. And also from the um, FFN to uh, GLU, the gated linear unit, which is quite, wi quite widely used uh, these days compared with uh, the original FFN layer. So let's first talk about encoder, uh, decoder, uh, encoder only, uh, encoder decoder, encoder only versus decoder only model. Uh, the original transformer is actually an encoder uh, decoder architecture. So, for example, this translation task, we first encode the source sentence, translate English to German, this is good, and then we pass it through the encoder model, and then the decoder model is going to um, I'll generate a token for the outputs. Okay, so an encoder on the left and a decoder on the right. Okay, uh, here we have more examples, uh, translation, acceptability, um, and also uh, semantic similarity. Find the similarity between these two sentences, give a score, uh, summarization, given the input sentence, and summarize into an output sentence. So we have offer a unified text to text model for transfer tra for transfer learning on various NLP tasks. And the prompt is usually fed to the encoder. Um, this is the encoding block, and then the decoder is going to generate the answers. Generate the first answer, and then the second token, and then the third token, uh, one after another. Second category is the encoder um, only model, okay, like the bird, which is bidirectional encoder representation for transformers. It is an encoder only language model with uh, uh, two pre training objectives. One is the mass language model, very widely used these days. The other is next sentence prediction, which is not quite widely used these days. So, mask the language model is saying we can mask the ways like 15% or percent, some several certain percentage of the input tokens at random, and then train the model to predict those mask tokens. And those mask tokens can see both the token before it and also the token after that. Uh, for example, here we have a, a created a mask. The movie is very boring. Uh, we put a mask right here, and uh, we pass it through the encoder and then try to predict uh, the, the mass will work. Uh, very rarely used task these days, the next sentence prediction to give two sentences and predict whether sentence B is the next sentence of uh, sentence A. And then the pre trained model can be fine tuned to downstream tasks. So the attention mask for um, encoder only model is like this is full because. The to a token can see not only the future token, but also uh, the previous token, but also the future token. So each token can attend to each other. Decoder only model, the attention mass is only half, only the, uh, the down triangle, since a token can only see the previous token. 
but tokens are only through the previous token, but not the future tokens. Okay. So GPT uh, stands for Generative Pre-Train Transformer is a decoder-only uh, language model. And the pre-train objective is the next word of prediction. Okay, given a sentence, given a sentence, um, where does it predict the next word? So a robot must obey the order given it when it predict it. And that word can only attend to the uh, tokens before that. Therefore, the attention mass is positive. Okay, it's only attending to something before it. And then similar to the previous, uh, the pre-trained model can also be fine-tuned to different downstream paths. And larger model, we don't even need to fine-tune, but uh, can have this zero shot, few shot capability, which we are going to discuss them later. So just tell the task or just give a few examples without having to fine-tune on, on a particular task, they can um, uh, realize uh, new tasks to achieve new tasks. Now let's switch here to talk about absolute positional encoding versus the uh, relative positional encoding. So absolute positional encoding uh, fills the positional information into the into the input embeddings, okay, the, and also the QKV. So the information is going to propagate through the entire transformer since the input embedding is the very source, the very beginning of a transformer. But relative encoding, uh, keep keep an eye on the relative distance, relative distance information by impacting only the attention source, okay? not the input embedding, but the attention source by adding a bias or modifying the queries of the keys, not the value, okay? Since the attention map only depends on the query and the key, this QK transpose. And the advantage is that you can deal with long context. For example, reading a whole book, reading a whole movie, very long context. Um, during training time, we may not have seen uh, such long context, but we wanna train short and inference, inference test long, okay? train short, test long. So that's where, uh, what that's the advantage of relative positional encoding. It's very easy to extrapolate. Uh, for long context and inference time. So we'll introduce two kinds of relative position encoding. One is the um, attention with linear biases, the alibi position, position encoding. The other is the rotary position embedding, which is the rope. So let's start with the alibi. The idea is to change the position encoding to be only related to the relative um, distance. For example, Q1 and K1, the relative distance is zero, but Q1, Q2 and K1, the relative distance K minus Q is minus one. And QK, uh, Q2, K2, the relative distance is zero. But here, uh, Q4, K2, what is the relative distance? Two minus four, so it's minus two. Okay. Similarly, uh, here, Q5, K, K4, the relative distance is minus one. So we have uh, this extra attention map, which is an offset, which is an offset to the original uh, attention map. Okay. So to add this offset to the original matrix, we define this as the relative uh, distance instead of adding it to the input token embedding. The input token embedding doesn't change, but only the attention map changes. I will manually set this strength, the strength which is, modi uh, which is modified with uh, this position, uh, out of position encoding and added to the original attention map so that you can capture the, the information between the relative distance uh, between two tokens. So although, for example, some of the uh, token multiplied with uh, each other um, is the same, but adding the position, relative, relative position encoding, the result might be different. Uh, the second one is slightly more challenge, uh, more difficult, but it's uh, very widely used. Uh, for example, Lama basically is using this rotary position embedding. And so what we do here 
we want to rotate, we want to rotate the embedding in a 2D space. In order to rotate it, we first need to cast this very long, like 4K um, embedding into, into a two dimensions. And how do we do that? We split the dimension from D to two D over two pairs. Okay, so uh, we have many pairs, we have two groups, the first half of D, the second half of D, we, we put them together. And now the entry of the first one becomes a 2D, um, it becomes a two dimensional value, X1 and X2, where we can represent X1 and X2 in the 2D space. And then we are going to rotate it uh, by M theta. M is basically the uh, index, first entry, second entry, third entry, sixth entry. If the total hidden dimension is 12, uh, the largest position is six, since we are dividing by them by half and put them into a 2D, 2D space. Okay, so M is the position of the token, and here this index is the position of the heat in the hidden dimension. Okay, so we rotated by M theta. Therefore, we added uh, this positional information into the original uh, representation of Q and K. So here we are, uh, we need a pretty big number to distinguish uh, different tokens. So this is the theta representation is uh, 10,000 to the power of uh, minus two I minus one divided by B is the hidden dimension. And why do we need a pretty big number? Since each time when we rotate, we wanna rotate a pretty small value Otherwise, if you rotate by too high, you come come back to the uh, you cannot no longer distinguish these two vectors. Once you rotate by too high, you come to uh, the same original place. Therefore, we just want to rotate it by a little bit, by a little bit. Therefore, we have a pretty uh, large uh, value here to in order to distinguish uh, more tokens, distinguish more tokens. And what if we use um, this approach, the rotation approach, and you just rotate the representation by grouping every two values into a into the 2D space and then rotate it. What if we multiply the query and the key um, using the rotate the value? Okay, so um, this is rotating the Q and rotating the K. Um, they are coming from different uh, uh, different locations. One is M, the other is M. And here we are looking at the J hidden dimension. Uh, we plug in, uh, this is original Q, original K. Uh, we are rotated by M epsilon in this case. Okay? And here rotated by N epsilon in this case, because M and N is their corresponding token number, okay? corresponding token number. So this is a token number. Okay? Don't, uh, don't misunderstand this M versus this index. So this index is related to the hidden dimension. And this M is related to the uh, token number. The first token, second, second token, third token. So this is within the first token, within the second token. Uh, what is the index of the embedding? We may have a 4K embedding divided by two, it can range from, uh, from zero um, to 2K. Um, the phase angle of inner product of two complex numbers is basically the phase difference between these two complex uh, vectors. So if you multiply them together, um, here we multiply the Q and K together. So the phase value would be the difference between uh, the first phase value of uh, the first uh, of Q and the phase value of K. And so I'm, that's why here we have M minus N. So I'm minus n is basically the relative uh, position. Okay, that's why we call it relative. Uh, that's why it's a relative positional encoding. It only depends on the difference between m and n, the token number between q and k. Bit complicated here. I'll pause a little bit to answer questions. Yeah. Thank you. 
Mm -hmm. So uh, you have uh, say, right? Let's say you have ten words. Right? You have ten words. The same word appearing in location one versus location ten. Previously, you cannot distinguish that. Now we want to distinguish whether uh, this word appeared in uh, position one or the last position, right? And that can be distinguished by the location. Okay? You wrote it by m theta. M is basically your, is your, your position, whether it's zero, one, two, or 10. If it is 10, that vector will be, that, uh, that vector will be rotated by a large, larger angle. If it's zero, it will be rotated by a smaller angle. And the relationship between Q and K only depends on their relative location. It will only depend on, dependent on M minus N. Okay, and let's see, now what is the general form? Okay, previously we are just multiplying uh, Q and K, uh, Q and K, that's very easy. Now we are doing the rotation by uh, working on each uh, pair of the value. Okay, so by each pair of the value, we are rotating, ro rotating them, but uh, M theta one, M theta two, M theta D over two. Why D over two, since we are, um, grouping the total hidden dimension, the D hidden dimensions into two groups. Each group has D over two. And we put the first one and concatenate them together in the 2D space. That's why we have a, a D over two right here. That's the general form of this rotation, uh, of this rotation matrix. And we modify this rotation matrix with the original matrix. That's a very simple uh, implementation. So what is good about uh, the rope uh, position encoding? We can extend the context window. So we can we want to process very long context so that we can process very long documents, long books, and long movies, for example. Um, like Lama, the original Lama, first version has 2K context length. Lama 2 becomes 4, uh, 4K. And GB4 used to be 8K. But I feel with... Uh, larger uh, context length. So we can actually extend the context length by uh, the interpolation, okay, the interpolation. Uh, for example, in the case here, previously we wrote it by m theta, m theta. If we have a, we are doubling the context length, we can wrote it by m theta divided by two, okay? Lama, uh, m theta divided by two. So that's the intuition. Okay. We should interpolate, this is the original uh, uh, during the pre-training uh, pre range. And we want to fit the same pre-training range. Previously, it is from 0 to 2K. Now we want to interpolate uh, from 0 to 4K uh, so that we put more doubling the frequency from here to here. Okay. We are interpolating a lot of dots in between them. So now we are falling into the same range rather than uh, falling into this unseen range during training, okay? Rather than using this unseen range. So we wanna change the theta to be theta divided by two so that we can um, fit a lot longer than uh, a longer context. So here the blue part is the original context length. Uh, this green part is the interpolated context length. Okay, so that's position encoding. And now let's talk about the KD cache. Okay, introduce the multi head attention, multi query attention, and also the uh, group the query attention. Uh, so KD cache can be pretty large in long context space. Say, let's see this example. Um, we have query key and value. We have three words here. I think of three tokens. I love. Arthrenium in this case, and this is embedding f zero i x one love two arthrenium, and we project it into the q zero k zero and v zero q one k one v one q two k two v two. Okay, and then we calculate the attention score given this new uh, new word arthrenium. Uh, we calculate the attention score by modifying q k with uh, a q two with k zero. 
into this query two uh, with uh, with a uh, with p zero. This is query two with p one, and then we uh, calculate q two with k two. Okay, so that's the we use this um, as a weighted sum for the for the values. Okay. Uh, v v zero times zero point three, v one times zero point one, etc. So uh, we need to store those keys and values for all the previous tokens so that we can perform the pension uh, computation. So in the previous example, when we are calculating uh, the second of the X2, okay, we need to store the, um, the K and V for the zeroth entry, for the first entry, et cetera, so that we can attend to them to calculate uh, this attention score like 0.3, and 0 0.1. So we need to put, uh, to store these keys and values for all the previous tokens in the, in the somewhere. Um, originally, if we don't have a KV cache, we need to recompute each time. Okay, so here we have four tokens, um, token one multiplied with a P1, K1, and we have to, each time we have to compute everything um, from two one three one to two k one to two three two two three k one etc. With a KV cache, we don't need to recompute. Okay, given a new when a new token comes, now we only calculate everything related to that new token. And for the all the previous tokens, we already keep it somewhere rather than recompute it. We only recompute uh, for the new token, and then we store it in the KV cache. And finally, we can uh, multiply with the value to get a weighted sum. Uh, results. So we only need the current current token and only calculate the key and the value for the current token and store everything before that in the KV cache. And as a result, the KV cache will get longer and longer because as the sequence gets long, uh, the KV cache will grow proportionally. So how do we calculate the size of the KV cache? Uh, we can Calculating this way, like gamma two seven b, the KV cache will be uh, first of all you multiply the mini batch size. Each layer you have independent KV cache. Even has you have an independent KV cache, and this is the hidden dimension of the KV cache, like one twenty eight for each head. Uh, so one twenty eight multiplied by thirty two has altogether we have four k hidden dimension. Um, this is the length of the sentence. And we have multiplied by two because one is for, for P, one is for value. Um, two bytes, because I have P16, that's two bytes. So actually that's half a microbyte or five, 12 kilobyte times the batch times the uh, sentence, sentence loss. Like for Lama 213B, the layer increased from 32 to 40. Number of pads also increased from 32 to 40. The embedding per head stays the same, 128. And two bytes, so eight hundred kilobyte, uh, kilobytes times batch size times n, and similarly for the seventy billion parameter model, layer doubled to 80, 80 layers. And uh, KV has uh, also increased to sixty four, so altogether we have two and a half megabytes per batch size uh, and per to uh, per token. Okay, and actually that can get pretty big. Um, we plug in some numbers into batch size is one, just one sentence. Uh, the length is 512. That's actually one point, more than one gigabyte to store the KV cache. If the sequence length is 4K, which is roughly uh, a paper, right? a paper, uh, it'll take uh, 10 gigabytes, 10 gigabytes just to store uh, those uh, the KV cache. Not to mention if uh, we have multiple users, like 16 users, uh, try to read 16 books, uh, 16 papers at the same time, it actually require 160 gigabytes. And each A100 GPU, H100 GPU has 80 gigabytes of memory. So only storing the KV cache for 16 users, that will require uh, two A100 GPUs. Each A100 GPU is pretty expensive, so that increase that has uh, the inference cost. It can also actually exceed the model size. Okay? It grows much uh, quicker. The model size actually stays the same. 
So this is how we calculate the model size. Uh, this is the KV cache size in blue for the MHA. Uh, this is the batch size. As the number of users increase, um, the memory occupied by the KV cache will grow linearly. Even surpass the model size. So how do we deal with that? Can we save the KV cache by sharing some of the key and the values? So that's the idea for um, multi-query attention. Compared with the multi-head attention, you have n has uh, for query, and also n has for key and the value. Therefore, when we are calculating the size of the KV cache, uh, we are multiplying with uh, a very big value, the KV cache, KV has. What we can do here is uh, simplify the n hat into just one hat. For query, we still have n hats, but for key and value, we just store one copy. Okay? We just store one, one copy of the key, one copy of the value, compared with the multi hat attention. So this is the multi query attention. Query stays the same, you still have a lot of queries, but keys and values are shared. You have just one copy of the key and value. Unfortunately, this will lose a lot of model capacity. So a trade-off in the middle is the GQA. Okay? So GQA stands for group query attention. You have many queries still, uh, like before, but a group of them, like a group of two queries, share the same key and the same value. Okay? So a group of two queries share the same key and the same value. And as a result, altogether we have eight uh, query has Two of them share a key and a value, so we have only four keys and four values. And typ typically, um, it, uh, the, the ratio between group versus the total number of uh, query has is eight times. Um, every uh, eight elements will share the same uh, key and value. This is pretty similar to the normal convolution versus stepwise convolution versus group convolution. A trade off between the model capacity versus the computation complexity. So let's see how does the uh, GQA and multi uh, group query attention and multi query attention help? Which one will be the lowest? Multi query attention. With multi query attention, you have only one copy of the weights uh, of the key and the value. So this is uh, multi query attention in the bottom. The number of has is just one. Um, the body, um, the group period attention, you have eight has versus the full uh, body head attention, I have 64. So that's the difference between these three uh, different architectures with respect to uh, the KV cache size. When the batch size gets longer, actually, the redu uh, reduction is pretty significant. And previously, uh, you require 320 gigabytes for, I believe, 70 billion times about. Cannot fit a single node, but now it's below 80 gigabytes. It can fit a single H100 node. And let's see how is the accuracy impacted. Actually, the GQA, the GQA can match the accuracy of the MHA under uh, very large model sizes. Okay, so here is comparing MHA and uh, MQA and GQA. Uh, for different benchmarks, you can see the um, multi query attention sometimes lose uh, accuracy a little bit, but GQA is doing pretty well, sometimes even higher accuracy. Uh, therefore, in later networks, GQA is very widely used. The last change is actually from um, FFN layer into the um, gated linear units, uh, the GLU layer. The difference is that FFN just consists of uh, two simple matrix multiplications uh, with uh, such kind of inverted bottleneck with the uh, uh, ReLU or ReLU in the middle. But um, three GLU basically uh, have uh, two differences. One is there are three matrix multiplications, one, two, three, and there is a gating um, element-wise function okay, calculating the element-wise between these two the results between these two tensors and then pass it through another matrix modification. And why here is 8D over three? Well, three of them, 
AB over three, AB over three, AB over three, three of them is eight, same as four plus four, okay? And the second uh, difference is here is using a different activation function, the switch uh, activation function. Uh, switch activation function, first matrix multiplication, element-wise multiplication with another matrix multiplication, and finally, uh, do another matrix multiplication. And these two matrix multiplications can be can be fused into a single one. Okay. And complexity result-wise, and you can see the uh, using the uh, SWE GLU is actually giving a pretty good results. And here is comparing uh, different activation functions. So this is the uh, uh, switch function. This is the GLU activation function. They look very similar, I would say. Um, but uh, there's some subtle difference between, the, uh, between here and here. If you want to go deeper about uh, this switch function. All right, so with that, we can introduce some of the modern large language models. So they are improving pretty fast, scaling up. Um, people find scaling them up can have very good, um, many different capabilities. For example, we call it emergent ability. Okay? Scaling up the model will unlock more capabilities. Despite that, it's taking a lot of deep memory. So this is the growth of deep memory. This is the model size. Why people need so much model size? Because they can have a lot of cool capabilities. Uh, for example, here, we give it a very interesting task called the modified arithmetic. Uh, the symbol represents a simple mathematical operation like 100 plus 200 equal to 301. Basically added one to the original answer. One plus one equal to three. Two plus two into the five. Right? So this is the modified arithmetic, and this is the accuracy of this new task. When the model is small, the accuracy keeps very low, make no change, no improvement until a certain point. Um, when the model gets much gets larger, so this is measured in the model uh, scale measured by the trillion flops. You can throw a lot of GPU compute. Suddenly, the accuracy gets much higher. Suddenly, the emergent abilities uh, will appear. Similarly, for other tasks, uh, like word and scramble, the capability suddenly increase when the model is larger than the version scramble. What is a word and scrambling? The word HTE is a scrambled version of the English word. So, similarly, the word S O H T P O to a scrambled version of the English word photos. Okay, just reshuffled um, the order of the word, trying to uh, decipher what its original word. So that's the word uh, unscramble. And the ability doesn't appear until the trillion flops exceed a certain, certain threshold. That's why we need the large language models due to those emergent abilities. So GPT-3 basically scaled up top of GPT-2 uh, to be few short learners. Right. They then enabled in context learning capability. So these are very important concepts. So, what is few shot learner? What is in context learning? So, in order to learn a new task, previously we have to fine tune the model, okay, pre train it, and then fine tune it on the specific task that is desired. For example, translation, um, we give an example one to the grid, calculate the gradient, update the model to another iteration, example two give it a ground truth um, between these two languages, do the gradient update, and up, and finally, we get a new model, feed it into a new uh, prompt, and try to get a new answer. Okay? So that's learning through fine tuning, which require back propagation, pretty expensive. And people find that once we scale up a large language model to a, to a much bigger value, uh, bigger size, we can Generalize to new tasks, new tasks without without having to fine tune them. But through zero shot learning or few shot learning, zero shot learning is basically saying, given just direct, tell me the description of the new task, and then we can achieve the new task. Few shot learning basically says, given a few demonstrations, given a few examples, 
without telling you what is the task, how to solve the task. It can help you solve the task. For example, this is zero, zero shot learning. Um, predict the answer. Um, give a, only give a natural language description. But here, the description is translated English to French. And then given the English, it will predict the French. Okay, so this is no graded update. We never trained on many um, English to French pairs. We never trained on that. And few short learning, uh, in addition to the task description, we also want to give it a few examples. Uh, examples, 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 um, English French pairs, and then given a new word of English is going to predict French. So that's few short learning. And these large models, and when the model um, gets larger, the few short learning capability begins to appear in this area. So there's 175 billion parameters. Uh, this is the accuracy. This is the number of examples in the context. As you give it more examples in the context, the accuracy will emerge, will increase for these big, uh, big, uh, big networks. But for these two small networks, no matter how many examples you feed in the context, the accuracy doesn't quite improve. So this is the GPT fam. This is the GPT family actually growing pretty fast. Uh, later ones are not released, so we don't know. Uh, and then the open source version quickly catched up since about twenty twenty two. Uh, first one is OPT model, an open retrain transformer, large language models. Uh, Meta open source uh, different sizes ranging from one twenty five million to one seventy five billion. This is zero shot. Uh, capability with the few shot uh, capability. And it has, uh, uh, it's a pretty pioneering work. It uh, enable us to do a lot of research. Here is using a very simple random activation in RFN. It's using pre norm, the decoder only architecture. And then uh, Meta released this Llama uh, model. Okay? And here it's using the uh, switch ELU, switch activation function followed by the gated linear units. Gated linear units is basically three uh, matrices, A AD times divided by three, and it's using the row rate positional uh, embedding. We just talked about that. The row rotating um, interpolation. The 7 billion parameter model has 32 has, 32 layers. Context lens is only 2K at that time. Hidden dimension is uh, is 4K, since the hidden dimension for each pad is 128, then 32 has, and it has much better performance than the previous open source models. And later, they built a Llama 2, which extended the context length from uh, 2K to 4K. So, and also the trading token increase from about 1 trillion to 2 trillion tokens. And still, the uh, the performance has not saturated. If you keep training, the accuracy will, the perplexity will uh, keep de decrease. Lama 2 introduces uh, this GQA, the group query attention to save the size of the given cache so that I can fit longer context. Uh, this is for the 7B model. Okay. It also introduced instruction tuned version and using the supervised fine tuning to align with uh, the human results. Uh, that's the Lama 2 chat. And here it's comparing the uh, capability between GPT-4 and Lama 2 still uh, behind. So this is what, where we were uh, in the last year's lecture. And this year, very exciting, Lama 3 came trained on even larger corpus by even spending even more uh, GPU, uh, GPU hours. Right? Um, more training tokens from 1.8 trillion tokens to 15 trillion tokens, multilingual tokens. And the GPU resource uh, consumption is much higher. It's 50 times more flux than Lama 2. Okay? Uh, the flagship model has 405 billion parameters. So if one GPU is 80 gigabytes, you can easily calculate how, much, how many GPUs do you need to serve uh, the model. 
And as even larger uh, complex loss, phase model has 8K, instruction tuned version has 128K, long complex version. Uh, the post tuning technique, uh, we'll talk about these uh, supervised fine tuning, uh, rejection sampling, um, and PPO, the direct preference optimization techniques. And a very small model, very popular small model is the uh, Mistral 7B model. So it all performed on a two, um, even 34 billion times the model. An interesting part here is the uh, sliding window attention, sliding window attention rather than the full attention. Uh, here is using the sliding window attention. And also using, uh, um, and also use the, you can stack multiple such, um, techniques to achieve a longer contest now. Since just one layer, you have limited contest now. You cannot see everything before it. But after a couple of layers, uh, receptive field, receptive field, receptive field is going to propagate and finally gets longer. But it's deprecated uh, since V2. A very interesting part is the Chinchilla law, which is describing the relationship between the parameters and also the number of training tokens. So basically it's saying that uh, the parameter as the parameter grow from 400 million, 1 billion, 1 trillion, uh, the number of training tokens also need to grow. You cannot just grow the model without growing the data. The data and model has to grow, grow up proportionally. However, um, the trade-off is different when we consider the inference uh, computation. For example, LAMA model, um, is trained on much la larger amount of tokens. Okay, from uh, like 10 billion times the model, uh, the model is trained by a uh, much larger amount of tokens than 200, way beyond 200 billion. It's actually uh, 2 trillion tokens so that we can spend more on training so that the inference cost will be lower. With the same number of parameters, the accuracy will be higher. All right, so with that, we'll conclude the lecture today. Later, we'll con continue to talk about those advanced topics in the next Tuesday's lecture.